Have you ever wanted or needed to do some low-level USB packet analysis? There are some products out there that can do it, such as the Beagle USB 480, which is 1300 bucks. Or maybe you only need to analyze a keyboard or a gamepad or something like that, and then you only need to fork up $500 for the Beagle USB 12. Elisys also has some options up in the multiple hundreds or thousands of dollars. Now to be fair, this product does do USB 2.0 speeds, so it'd be the equivalent of the Beagle 480. Teledyne LaCroix also has a similar thing, and I could go on and on and on, but I think you get the picture. There's so many of these devices, they're a lot more expensive than you might be able to afford as a independent firmware developer. But you know what? There are better options out there. Like this project that was featured on Hackaday. It's a cheap USB sniffer that works with Wireshark. And it's by Alex Taradov. And he did this with an FPGA and a Cypress USB microcontroller that takes the data. And it's all open source. It's on GitHub. And it can handle low speed, full speed, and high speed. So USB 2.0 speeds. And the cool part is you can build it for less than $50. And it even has a nice little case that you can 3D print yourself. Uh, there's hardware bring up instructions here for how to program the hardware after you build it. And then simple instructions for operating it with Wireshark. So really cool project uh, and gives you a lot of the same capabilities that those multi-thousands of dollars products give you. So what I'd like to do is go through what I did to actually build one of these for myself. And everything in that bin folder on GitHub should give you what you need. There's a bomb. That means bill of materials, which is all the parts you need to buy. There's Gerbers that you can use to make the PCB. There's binaries compiled. There's a driver if you need it from on Windows. I didn't need it. Uh, and then builds of the software for Linux and Windows. He has the project uploaded to Osh Park, so you can just buy the bare PCBs there. Here's a picture of what the top of the board looks like. Then there's a picture of what the bottom of the board looks like. So lots of capacitors and resistors to install yourself if you're going to do it. He also provided it's a KiCad project, so you can actually look at the actual PCB design. It has a really cool 3D viewer, so you can kind of see what the board will look like. Now, if this would be your first soldering project, I probably wouldn't recommend it. Uh, IC4 right here in particular is a QFN package that's going to be pretty difficult to solder yourself. You're going to need a hot air station. IC6 and IC10 are crystals that are also probably going to need hot air to solder. And then you've got uh, IC1 and 9 which are going to need some fine pitch drag soldering probably. Those are a little bit more accessible to do with just a soldering iron. So let's jump in and do this. Let's start with this QFN USB Phi chip. This is probably the most difficult part to solder on the entire project. So what you have to do here is ideally you'd use solder paste, but I'm not gonna do that. Um, what I'm gonna do is put solder on all the pads especially that center pad, because that's ground, so you really need that soldered. Uh, but the idea is get solder on all of the pads as evenly as you can, and then we'll use hot air to actually solder the chip down. Now, unfortunately, it's pretty hard to get just the right amount of solder on that center pad, and I'm still not that good at it, so you'll probably watch me struggle a little bit with this in the video here. At this point, I have way too much solder on that center pad, so I'm trying to just take some of it off and use it on the other pads. But I'm probably going to have to use some wick here in a minute to really cut down on the amount of solder on that center pad. I'm struggling a little bit here getting solder on all of the pads, but I just need a little more flux, and the flux will make everything flow a lot better. And there you can see I'm now getting a good solder coverage everywhere. Now I'm going to give up on that center pad for a minute and just get the other pads on, on the other 
uh, parts I'm going to have to solder with hot air all set up here. So these are crystals. IC6 is one of them. I guess technically it's really an oscillator. And I'm just putting solder on all four pads here. And I'll heat it up later, as you see. But first, let's get some solder on the four pads for this oscillator as well. Just like the last one, all I need to do is just dab a little bit of solder onto each of the four pads. If those two pads on the right look kind of funny, yeah, we'll come back to that in just a minute. Okay, so now let's try to get some of that extra solder off of the QFN package, because that would be way too much in the middle there. Like, it's not going to solder anything with that much. And that's looking a little bit better. But I guess I wanted to go a little bit more into it and try to get more off. So I'm at that point, yeah, it's looking pretty good. So now it's time to actually solder this thing down. And I have to place the component as closely as possible to the center. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect, uh, but it did take me a while to get it just right. Uh, because it's going to position itself once the hot air has the solder up to temperature. So it looks like it's pretty good here. Now I'm heating up the chip. I'm using about 50% uh, airflow on my hot air station here. And I'm also on a preheater, which makes it a lot quicker for the hot air to do its job. And once I notice that the solder's actually getting hot enough and molten, what I'm going to do is just tap the chip with my tweezers a little bit. And when I do that, it'll kind of position itself. And that'll just really tell me that the solder's up to temperature there, if you just saw that. And at that point, I'm pretty happy, so I'm just going to gradually take away the heat and let everything cool down. But that's that's really the process right there of soldering that QFN. Now let's work on the crystals slash oscillators, whatever you wanna call them. So I'm gonna add a little more flex here and then put the oscillator in place right on those little blobs of solder that I put on the pads. And uh, just quick reminder, these are really tiny, so it's a little bit harder than it looks to place these. Uh, the flux is also sticky, which means that if you get it on your tweezers, they kind of try to stick to the chip. So same process here. I'm just going to heat it up. Again, it's on a preheater, so it's going to be a lot faster than it might otherwise be. And as soon as everything's good, you'll actually kind of see the chip even wiggle a little bit just from the air. But... Um, yeah, right there, it kind of popped into place, and every time I tap it, it's popping right back where it should be. So at that point, I know I'm good to go. Gradually take the heat away again, and boom, that chip soldered. I'll do it one more time here with this one, but here's where we'll run into the situation where I accidentally put too much solder on those rightmost pads. So when I try to put this oscillator on here, it's not going to fit very well as you're about to see. Whoops. Yeah, it's trying to stand up really high. It can be kind of hard to get a good perception of depth while you're working under this microscope, but trust me, that crystal was diagonal. It wasn't flat against the ground, so I just needed to uh, even out the solder pads a little bit there. Super easy to fix with an iron. So now that I've done that, I can actually put the crystal in place. And once again, I'm just going to heat it up with my hot air station. But first of all, I got to remember, I kind of used the flux there when I was evening out the pads, so I got to put a little bit more. So now that it's all fluxed up again, I'll put the crystal in place. And then we'll get the heat on it. But 
I'm being a little too much of a perfectionist here, to be honest. I didn't need to uh, move it around so much because it's going to jump itself into place and you're going to see it again here. Uh, once I'm heating this up, you can even see it kind of moving around with the heat. So at that point, it's all good to go. Again, I'm going to tap it just to really 100% be confident that it's uh, soldering itself. But yeah, it's good. So once again, gradually take the heat off. And the good news now is I am done with the hot air. Uh, those are the three parts that I really need hot air to solder. So now what I'm doing is I'm going around the edge of the QFN because it didn't quite solder perfectly. You can see like some of the pins have a little more solder than the others. So what you want to do is really try to even that out. Um, it doesn't always work on all QFNs, by the way. Uh, some QFNs, the pads on the side don't work as actual pads. Like they're not connected to the bottom pads, but in this case they are. And I'm basically just doing drag solder in here along the edge. And um, yeah, just trying to make all of the connections look good. And drag soldering is super easy. It's all about the flux. If you can get that flux to to uh, flow the solder for you, I mean, all you need to do is just put some solder on your iron tip and it just flows. And here's the last little edge here. I think the iron's starting to get a little bit low on solder. So I probably should have put a little more there, but after I dragged that, now you may have noticed there that one of those pads, in fact, you can see it on the left side of the chip right now, doesn't look soldered. And so if you notice that, you would definitely be right. And what's gonna happen later on when I actually try to test the, the board is you're gonna see that it doesn't fully work and it's all because of that bad solder joint right there. So I'm not sure how I missed that during my initial assembly. So I'm just gonna go with the excuse that it was late and I was getting tired. So um, cleaning uh, off all the flux that I can here with just 99% isopropyl alcohol and a Q-tip. And yeah, once again, just looking at that, you can see that one pad just looks funny compared to all the rest of them. I should have noticed, I didn't. So next we're gonna do the FPGA, which is a big QFP chip. And uh, these, like, I think a lot of people are intimidated by these kind of chips, and these are actually my favorite to solder. The, especially under the microscope, they're super easy. And I don't know, like once you get the hang of the drag soldering, it's actually kind of fun. So I've already put flux on there, and all I'm doing here is I'm just tweaking the position of the FPGA so that all of the pins line up with the pads on the board. And it's a little bit harder than it looks. Um, keep in mind that every tiny, tiny movement your hand makes is quite a large movement under the microscope. So definitely don't do it if, if you've been drinking a bunch of coffee. But uh, yeah, that's looking pretty good right now. So now what I'm going to do is just tack down a few pins on two corners of the chip to so that it's not going to move while I do the rest of the soldering. And you can see that's really ugly there on the right. It doesn't matter because with the drag soldering, I'll completely fix that. So I don't really care too much about being precise here. I just need the thing tacked down so it's not going to move. And uh, the tip I'm using here is a hoof tip that has a concave um, shape to it so that it holds just a little bit of solder. It makes it a lot easier to do drag soldering. So that's honestly looking pretty good right now. But the perfectionist in me wants it tacked down just a little bit better, so. That's what I'm doing now. And now I'm a lot more confident. I just really wanted to make sure that it was tacked down and wasn't gonna move. 
Now, what I do have to do here is put Flux back on again. And I haven't always had to do this, and I think I've said this on some of my previous videos, but I tend to do a better job soldering if I put more Flux on top after this. And I don't know if it's just because the chips have been exposed to the air or what, but the more flux the better, and I like a flux pen. You can also use like the the paste flux or whatever that other people use. And I completely screwed up my drag solder in here. Um, I probably shouldn't even be showing this to the world. I accidentally put the iron on the top part of the chip instead of on the pads. So it was like on the top of the legs, and that's not where I was aiming. It's just the depth perception under the microscope makes it hard to see exactly what you're doing. But it's fixable. Um, and I promise the drag soldering will only get better from here. <laughs> but uh, you just need more flux and you can fix any little mistake you make here. So uh, I'm just going to do drag soldering in the correct position. And you'll see that it goes pretty well from here on out. I just need to fix a little bridge over there. And look at how... Easy that should have been. Oh, it's not. Um, at this point, I'm just making it worse, so I need to add more flux. And like I said, flux is your best friend. Uh, it always makes things better. It's not your best friend to breathe, so don't breathe it, but use it. And yeah, just... The combination of adding more flux and removing solder from the iron tip makes it pretty easy to pull the rest of the excess solder right off that chip. And at some point you can just also kind of like drag it and that'll that'll make it go away, which is what I did there, but it didn't quite work. And boom, there we go. So that that was a little bit not the ideal drag soldering right there. But as we move on to the rest of the sides, you'll see more like how it's really supposed to go if you don't screw up. Okay, we'll give it another shot here, and it's going to go a lot better, I promise. So I'm putting a little bit more solder on the iron, and I'm correctly going to put it down near the pad. And boom, look at that. No mistakes, just perfectly dragged right across. So yeah, that initial placement is important. As long as you get that down and you've got plenty of flux, you're in for a treat. I did have a little extra solder from when I tacked it down, but you'll just kind of see that it doesn't matter. Um, it did make the dragging a little bit more difficult because I had too much solder on the iron, but that's pretty easy to fix with the flux. You just kind of have to play with it and get it to do what you want. So you see those three bridges, those will just go right away with another little touch of the iron. There we go. And sometimes I just find little things I'm not happy with after I do the dragging, and I can just touch the iron to just fix them up really easily. I think sometimes it's just a reflection of the light I'm using with the microscope, but doesn't hurt to check. And the last, like, what people would call difficult part to solder is the Cypress USB microcontroller. So this, this is like a chip that allows you to basically make a high-speed USB device. So a USB 2.0 device with pretty good speeds. So it's basically taking the, the USB data that the FPGA has decoded along with the phi and then uh, sending it off to the computer 
off to your computer that's recording the the sniffed data, I should say. And this is really no different from the QFP chip I just did. It's just that there's only two ends to it. So again, I'm going to tack two corners down. Doesn't have to be perfect. And then once they're tacked down, I'll reflux it and then do drag soldering again. I think I was being a little bit of a perfectionist on the positioning of the chip at this point, but it's fine. So here we go. That's not great. That's a little bit better. And then same thing on this corner. Just going to tack it down. Now you may notice there I screwed up and accidentally bridged a couple pins on the FPGA. I'll come back and fix that in just a minute. And once again, like I said, I'm going to put flux on top again. Just more flux, the better. And once I've done that, all I have to do is just drag solder this. It's not going perfectly, but it's still going pretty well. Now somehow I accidentally dumped a bunch of solder on there, but it's easy to fix because the flux still allows everything to flow. Even if it doesn't, you just have to add a little extra flux and then everything will be fine. But I didn't even have to do that here. Now a few of these pins are bridging a little bit, but they'll, those will clean right up. Especially if you add flux. I can't repeat it enough. Flux is just this magic thing that you just need when you're soldering. It fixes all your problems for you. It can probably solve marital issues. It can probably just any problem you can think of. Flux is a solution. And here we go again on this side of the chip. I'm going to go ahead and do drag soldering again. And I'm starting to run out of solder on the iron tip is really what's happening here. So I just needed to put a little bit more to get that concave section filled with solder. And once I do that, the drag soldering will go perfectly. And once again, just more flux. There are a few sections here that look like they're going to bridge, but if you go over it again, they'll just fix themselves. Now we can't forget to fix that bridge that I put on the FPGA on accident, but watch how simple it is to fix this. Do you need anything special like copper braid no you can just use your iron and flux it'll come right off boom at this point almost everything difficult is already done on the soldering it's just a bunch of tedious work now um, this little resistor network is pretty tiny I accidentally got a little bit of solder on the pads there while I was soldering some of the other stuff. So I'm probably gonna wanna pull that off with some copper braid. I guess you could just do this with hot air, but it would have been difficult for me to get the hot air station back out at this point. So I just want 
the pads as flat as possible. And then I'll just solder it by hand with the iron. These are incredibly tiny. Um, it's a lot harder than it looks because my tweezers keep wanting to stick to the part. So what I'm doing here is carefully guiding it into place while also making sure that it's not going to stick to the tweezer and just pull it right away. One trick here is you can put the tweezers in alcohol to make them quit grabbing on. But it really comes down to I just got to hold this part in place with the tweezers while I solder down a few of the pins. It's kind of just the same thing as tacking down the larger chips. You just got to get it to stay in place, and then once it's in place, soldering the rest of it's a lot easier. I'm fighting here a little bit with my depth perception under the microscope again. It's hard to see right where the solder is, um, especially while you're trying to do it. But yeah, just solder down those pins and don't forget about the flex. You only need a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of solder here. So just what you have stuck on your iron tip is usually good enough. You don't need to actually use the wire. I'm running into a bit of a problem soldering that one. I think it's because I just don't have enough solder on my iron. I probably should have just put a little more solder on the iron, but instead I just started actually putting the wire right down here. Eventually it caught on and, and flowed nicely. Now I'm gonna do the EE prom. And this is a pretty, pretty simple one. But first, I accidentally got a little blob of solder onto that pad, and it's in the way. It's preventing me from, from putting the chip on there. So I'm just using my iron to flatten it out a little bit. This is super easy to install. Just put it in place, tack down some legs, and you're done. I'm not succeeding very well at tacking it down, and it's probably partly just not flexed enough and partly just not enough solder on the iron. These legs on this chip are big enough that I can just put the solder right there as I'm trying to solder each leg. And yeah, that works pretty well. I honestly think it looks fine already, but uh, I kind of wanted all the legs to look similar as far as how much solder was on them. And over on this side, it's just more of the same thing. Boom, that's easy.
these little chips right here are comparators. Um, I think they're being used to detect different voltage levels on the the data pins because especially on high speed devices there's there's some weird voltage levels that can mean different things. Uh they're pretty straightforward to solder. The main trickiness is just they're so tiny. And uh again, just like making sure that your tweezers don't stick to the chip and pull them away. Which is kind of what happened right there when I was trying to position them. I had them in a perfect spot. I don't know what I was doing. But yeah, once you're holding it down, it doesn't need much solder. You can kind of just solder all the side, all of one side at a time. Just like that. You can just do that with all, all the chips and uh, the other side will be super easy to solder because with four legs on the right side already soldered down, it'll make soldering the left side really easy. See, it uses so little solder that you usually have enough just sitting there on the iron to do most of the soldering. Looks like I did maybe run out right there, though. It's easy enough to add just a little bit more, and that's all you really need. One more chip here. I had to rotate the board because it was the, the part was oriented the wrong way. And it's easier just to spin the board around rather than try to flip the chip around. You can get in a groove pretty quickly just doing these chips. At this point, I'm putting a little more solder on the iron because I'm running out again. And now the other side of these chips is going to be very, very easy. I don't even need to hold it down with the tweezers. Putting a little flux as usual to make it easier though. And that's the comparators. Okay, now let's move on to the 603 capacitors and resistors. The way that I like to do these is put solder on one side, like I just did there and like I'm doing here now. Uh, you'll notice that it's taking a little bit of heat to do that because that's a ground pin. And once I have it on one side, I heat it up, put the component into place, then remove the iron. But then I like to hold the component down, push down on it while I reheat it. And that just really makes sure it's flat against the board. Here's another example on C20 where I'm going to do the same thing. Sometimes the solder gets a little bit messed up when I do that, and I can just use some flux if I need to. Now for the other side of these components, I like to just use solder and not flux by itself if I can avoid it. 
because the solder has flux in it and then I don't have to get flux all over the board. See, that turned out pretty nice. But if it does get messed up, I'm not afraid of using flux. I just don't want to if I don't have to. Boom, that looks pretty nice too. So I'm not going to show the process of doing every single one of these 603 components because that would just be a waste of time. See there, I wasn't super happy with how that looked, so I just used a little bit of solder to get a little bit extra flex just to really make that, that joint look better. So there's a zillion of these LEDs and resistors and capacitors that are going on. Super easy to solder, just really, really tedious. It's all the same process, so I'm just zooming through there. And uh, once these are all done, the top of the board will essentially be done. I'm doing the USB connectors last, just because they, they're going to be a little bit more difficult than all the other components. And the other reason is, if I put them on first, it's going to make it harder to have the board upside down. So yeah, n nothing to really talk about here. It's just a whole bunch of the process I just described. Put solder on one side, solder it in, push it down and reheat, and then do the other side. A lot of people like to just dab flux all over everything during this part, and it doesn't hurt anything, but um, I like to avoid it if I can. Okay, now we're on the bottom side of the board, and it's this is another one of the resistor networks. Uh, I've already shown how to do this. It's just the same thing. It's the exact same part. And the bottom of the board is actually pretty simple. There aren't really any crazy components on it. I'd say this is probably the most difficult component on the bottom right here. And again, like the only thing that really makes it difficult is just how the flux makes the tweezer want to hold on to it. I'm being way too picky about the positioning here. I should have just left it alone. I'm probably going to regret messing with it too much. Sometimes you just have to say things are good enough when you're soldering stuff like this. I'm just going to get some pins tacked down, but you'll notice I'm struggling a little bit with that. I guess I'm kind of doing drag solder in there. And yes, that's ugly, super ugly. And don't worry, I'll fix that with flux. Now that I've got that one corner down, I can tack the other corner down. So I'm doing it a little bit differently than I did the last one, but it's all the same thing. Now I can just touch each little pin individually on the side and get a tiny bit of solder to flow off of the iron each time. There, just like that. I think I did a better job on this one than I did on the last one on the top side of the board. And I'll even just fix that one joint up right there. Uh, it'll need a little more uh, flux to really fix it. Looks like I ran out of solder too. Here, I got enough from the other pins. Still not super happy with that second pin from the top. But there, that's better now. Okay, now we have to do a diode. Uh, these are really simple to solder. It's kind of the same process as the capacitors and resistors. I just put solder on one pad and then heat it up and get the diode there. There's probably a ton of different ways that people solder these. That's just the way that I do it. 
And ideally, I would push down on it like I do with the capacitors and resistors, but the board's rocking around so much because of the components on the top side that I don't want to risk it. And I know that I'm soldering it just fine. I really should have been using a board holder or something like that to avoid it from rocking so much. And just like that, the diode is done. Except I'm trying to make it a little bit nicer. So here's what I think is the last really unique component on the bottom side of the board. It's a voltage regulator. It's got five pins, but it's it's not really any different from some of the other chips like the EEPROM, just a little bit smaller. Get it in place, tack down a pin or two, and you're done. Well, you're done after you solder the other legs. Yeah, so I got one pin tacked down, kind of failed to, to, to tack down the other one, but it's easy enough to just rotate the board around and get the other sides. At this point, it's not going anywhere, so now I just have to solder down the rest of the legs. Very simple. The rest of the bottom side of the board is just a bunch of resistors and capacitors. This is probably the most annoying part of building this. There's just so many of them and you have to get the right component values on each one. If you could have a board house populate some of these for you, that would probably be the best way to do it. Uh, just have them populate the bottom side, all the passives. It's not hard at all. It's just really tedious and you have to make sure to get every single component correct. You might notice that I'm not being super picky about making sure that the capacitors are perfectly parallel to the footprints. And honestly, I just don't care. It's going to be inside a case and I'm not making it for anybody else. So it's good enough for me. And you'll see just overall, I'm trying to avoid using flux whenever possible because the flux in the solder should be good enough. But sometimes I can't avoid it because I just get a little thing sticking out. And yeah, I'm just placing all these components on one side and then I'll just end it with a whole bunch of uh, soldering the other side. You'll see that shortly, right after I finish placing all these resistors. There's definitely going to be some solder joints that you're going to see here that look less than ideal. And again, this is kind of like a situation for me of I don't really care. It's good enough for what I need. Yes, I probably could have done a cleaner job, but once you're having to do 20, 30 of these things, you just want to be done with it. <laughs> okay, the entire bottom of the board is done now, and all that's left is the two USB-C ports and a USB-A port. So here I'm going to do one of the USB-C ports. And this is where you have to be very careful. Um, I actually built three of these boards, and on the first one, I didn't do a good job of soldering this down, and I actually ripped a few traces. So you really want to make sure that this thing has a lot of mechanical support, because it takes a lot of force when you plug in the cable. So what I do is I start out by just soldering a few of the pins to make sure that the port's held in place. 
So you'll see me doing that here. I'm just going to do the top two and the bottom two. And that's good enough for now. Now I want to really make sure it's held in place. So I turn it upside down. Now these pins don't go all the way through the board. So I'm just filling in solder on the bottom side. But just doing it on the bottom side is not going to be enough. I made that mistake on my first board. And it uh, ripped off as soon as I tried to plug a cable in. So... Yes, you can fill in this bottom part, but it's not enough mechanical support. You also need to solder the top side, and that's what I'm doing right here. Uh, you really don't want to skimp here. you got to make sure it's got good mechanical support. It's kind of difficult to get your iron in there, but... Um, if you get enough solder in there, the heat should transfer. And you just want it to really become a big blob that's all heated together. And once you've done that, it's really stuck down to that port. You might want to try uh, switching to a slightly smaller tip like the one that I have here. But you don't want it too small. A lot of mistakes that people make are due to using just way too small of a soldering tip. You want to use the largest tip that you can use because it's going to do a better job of transferring heat. I don't really have much more to say here. It's just the same thing. Getting all four of these pins soldered down. Sometimes when you're soldering, it just makes more sense to rotate the board so that you can make better contact. And that's the situation I was in right there. That angle works a lot better for soldering that. So now that that's all soldered down, I just need to do all these different pins. Um, just make sure you got flux there if you don't already. And it's basically just letting the flux take the solder right off your iron. There's nothing to it, really. I noticed that it looked like there was a little short right there on that chip. So I removed it really easily with flux. Here's another USB-C port. There's not really a whole lot to show here, so I'm just going to zip right through this really fast. It's all the same process, the exact same process that I did for the last port. I just can't stress enough, you really need to make sure that that port is attached strongly to the board. And yeah, let the flux do its magic. The final component to solder is the USB-A port. And this is just basic through-hole soldering, so... The, the easiest component on the entire board to solder. Just do your your nice through hole soldering. The the first type of soldering that everybody learns. I see a lot of people put flux on the board for soldering like this, and it's just not necessary. I guess maybe if you're solder is way expired and the flux doesn't work in it anymore but if you have even like barely expired solder it's going to be fine 
the flux in the solder is plenty for little through hole stuff like that. On these um, shield pins, I'm again, I don't really care too much about what the joints look like. Um, all I'm caring about is that it's really mechanically holding it in place. It may be good for there actually to be an electrical connection to ground there. So even if those joints look a little cold, it's fine. And here's the completed build. So I wanted to explain the ports a little bit. On the left side, there's a single USB-C port. That's the port that you plug into the computer that's doing the capture. And then on the right, there's a USB-C port and a USB-A port. That's essentially a pass-through. So you'd connect the USB-C port to an A port on the computer that's the host you're capturing. And then you'd plug the device you're capturing into the A port on the capture device here. And the cool thing about that is it means you can capture USB traffic of a completely different computer or device. So I could use this to sniff USB traffic on like a classic Mac or like a Windows 98 computer, even though they can't run the actual capture software with Wireshark. So that's what's really cool about devices like this and the Beagle and all those is they let you do that. They're way more flexible than just Wireshark doing USB PCAP or whatever. So now that I've got this thing all built, let's try to program it. So I'm going to plug it in over USB and you'll see that it did show up as a USB device. So the first step is to program the SRAM in the Cypress chip with the USB sniffer.bin file. And I did that and that actually caused it to disconnect and reconnect as a USB device, and now it's got the correct name. Um, the next step here is to program the EEPROM chip with the same contents, so that way it'll automatically come up correctly at every power cycle. And um, I think I actually power cycled the board here just to show that. Um, you'll see that it came up as a USB sniffer automatically. Now, we need to program the FPGA. So all this is stuff that Alex designed, um, super easy, just a few little commands you run on the command line. I think on Windows, it's pretty much the same thing. And there, it's all programmed. So he also made a little test to make sure that you're getting good performance out of the data transfer. And I run the test, I'm getting about 45 megabytes per second, which is right in the range that he said it should be. So at this point, I'm feeling pretty good about uh, this build and I'm ready to test this out. So the instructions say that you need to copy the binary into a specific folder that Wireshark wants to see it in. And it's uh, XCAP, so it's a mechanism that Wireshark has to add plugins automatically. So I copied it in there, and now if I launch Wireshark, by the way, you should probably install it from like a PPA that's newer if you're on Ubuntu. So I'm just going to set it for a low speed capture. You do have to say what kind of capture you're doing, like what type of device you're listening for. And then uh, fold empty frames, that's if you want to get rid of a bunch of useless junk in your capture which may be useful in certain cases, but usually you don't care about empty frames. So you can see it shows that the VBus is off and it's just doing these periodic updates to show that the capture is still working. So as soon as I plug in a device, what should happen is it'll actually recognize all the USB packets being transferred when I plug it in. And I did that but I'm getting some really weird results here. A bunch of line states. So something weird's going on. I'm not sure exactly what it is. This is supposed to be a gamepad. And at this point I was a little puzzled because the first build I did had worked correctly. So I went back and looked at the board and you may remember that I screwed up 
that one pin. It looked funny compared to the others, the, the third from the left. And yeah, looking at it from that angle, you can see it's not making good solder contact there. There may even be a small little short on the two pins next to it. But basically, all I need to do here is a little more drag soldering to really make sure that I've got a good connection on all these pins. So, plenty of flux. Recheck that, and that's looking a lot better now. Definitely is making a connection now. Now let's retest that. So I've got the sniffer hooked up to my computer. You can see it says VBus on because I now have power. And there's my uh, game controller. I'm gonna go ahead and plug it in. And now you're seeing data packets. You see it alternating between data zero and data one. You're seeing all the raw, the in, the ax. Uh, if there were nax, you'd see those too. You're seeing the keep alive. You're seeing that it's folding seven empty frames because I believe the polling rate only needs to pull every, every eight frames on this particular device. So this is information that, that you wouldn't have access to if you were just doing normal software USB sniffing with Wireshark. Now, do most people need access to this information? Probably not, but for somebody that's a firmware developer or maybe a device driver developer or just like anything really low level USB, um, you're going to be able to get way more detailed information with this than you could just by using like USB PCAP on Windows or, or the equivalent on Linux. And the cool thing is that Wireshark also does some parsing of the packet contents. Um, like if you do a, a flash drive, it'll parse some of the mass storage packets. And some of the other devices, like the Elasis ones, actually charge extra just for that capability. Like you have to have the multi-thousand dollar version just to do some of the HID, uh, mass storage, etc. type of parsing. So from that perspective, this is a really, really good deal. You can see right here, it's actually parsing the USB HID data, showing which buttons are pressed and which ones aren't. It's a lot of data to sift through. Um, so like you wouldn't necessarily wanna do this if you're, if you're looking at higher level transfers, but if you're developing firmware for a device and trying to figure out why something doesn't work randomly, um, you might be able to track down some kind of an issue or maybe you're not toggling between data zero and data one as you should be. Or, I don't know, maybe something's screwed up or it's calculating a, a bad checksum occasionally. That's the kind of stuff that this sniffer is going to be really useful for. So it's going to be a great tool for anybody working on USB devices to have access to. And I know I said earlier that it's uh, less than $50. It's probably going to be a little bit more once you factor in things like shipping, um, the cost of the PCBs cost for making the enclosure but it's still going to be well less than a hundred dollars to make one i think not including shipping i spent about a hundred and fifty dollars to make three of them and that included the osh park pcbs if you're going to build one you might as well just build three since osh park can give you three boards for a really good price and of course here's my uh 3d print of the actual enclosure it's uh this is a monoprice mini delta printer and it's definitely not a fancy printer but you don't need a fancy printer to print the case um you just need something that can do a big enough print obviously i've sped this uh <laughs> this video up a little bit but yeah you can just see it slowly building the enclosure. There's also another piece to the enclosure that's a flat end um, that goes on the other end of the case. And I didn't show that that part of the print here, but it's a very small part that doesn't take long to print. And uh, I wasn't really sure what kind of screw to use to put the enclosure together, but I just 
found something in my box of screws that seemed to fit nicely. And um, yeah, I built three of these. And I'm super happy with it. Um, it's definitely a bargain compared to other USB sniffers you might find out there. Uh, shout out to Wambam for their awesome build surfaces. Here's a little view inside the enclosure. Here's how I put it together. Um, you just slide the completed board, there it is by the way, into the enclosure. Um, there is a hole for a two pin connector I didn't populate, which is for a trigger, which is like if you want to trigger right when you want your USB capture to start. I didn't see myself needing that. Um, but it's easy to populate. So just stick that in there. It was a little bit tricky to get it to go in all the way and line up with the hole for the USB-C port, but I did get it. And then the other little piece just snaps right on there. And yeah, I guess maybe I didn't actually have the screws in my completed units at this point. But I did find a little screw that I could screw in there that that held the, the case on tight. And that's the final build. Thank you, Alex, for designing this amazing open source project. I'd highly recommend it.